so this morning we come back searching again and seeking the word of God and seeking the face of God. And one of the things that people who come to know about God, these two people that are walking through this land, no man's land, will be confronted with once they have an inner sense, an inner sense that there is God. Once they have an inner sense that, that there is God, the Bible somewhere says the spirit of God witnesses to our spirit. And so once the spirit of God witnesses to our spirit, to the man and the woman that are navigating this world, that there is a God. The next question is, what does this God look like? What does this God, and one of the things that cultures, people from different cultures, from different parts of the world, those who were inclined to believe that there is God, have one of the things that they've always been preoccupied with is the image of God. Hallelujah. <laughs> the image of God. Enya yezinto that abantu abakolwa yo emtabeni wonke abazhupa ngayo ukuthi unjani lo nkulunkulu ubukeka kanjani ubonakala kanjani. And what people have done is that in order to have a God that is relatable, that they can relate with, that is familiar, and that is acceptable, there has to be an image. And an image had to be something as close as possible to what they know and, can, and can identify with. And so from the ancient times, when different cultures accepted that there is a power that is above and beyond and super than their natural powers, the supernatural power. They sought to reduce that power to something that they can see. And so we know of idols. We know of objects. Is it all ET that people built? But in their minds, now we, we come with a form of a judgment, but in their minds, they were bringing God into some form and some shape that they can understand him, relate with him, and be able to touch him and feel him. And I want us to accept this morning that it is natural, it is natural for human beings to want to touch and feel. Hallelujah. Amen. I want us to accept this morning that it is natural for human beings to want to touch and feel. Human beings cannot deal with any experience that, that is beyond their touch and feel. And touch and feel is both touch and sensory, feeling the sensory, but also that appeals to the emotions. But that which appeals to their emotions, quickly they want to also experience at a physical level. So anything that is intangible, it confuses us as human beings. Why is that? It's because we experience this life at a sensory level. We walk in this life. We see in this life. We touch things in this life. And so our experience, our knowledge, and our wisdom is informed by things that are tangible. And whilst there are certain things, especially around mathematics and science, um, that we understand are abstract. We have also, even with those things, found a way, when we talk about science and we talk about chemistry, we have found a way to demonstrate how 
that process and that formula works in the physical. So scientists have found a way to explain how the intangible, which is the chemistry and the biology even, how that process unfolds and happens in the physical. So you can see it. And this is one of the reasons that scientists and those with a scientific mind cannot accept or struggle to accept that there is a God that they cannot experience in the physical, that they cannot bring down and bring into the lab where they can actually show the work, the practical work and steps of God. Amen. And so these two people that are walking through this land, at some point, once they have accepted, once they believe that there is God, once they have accepted and once they believe that there is a supernatural power, there is a superpower that is beyond them, that controls them, very soon they will be preoccupied with finding it. But finding it is not about just accepting it's out there. But they want to find where does he live? Where does she live? Where does it live? And what does it eat? Who is it with? And so constantly the mind is searching for familiarity. And this is where a lot of people today, as we talk about believing today, believing in 2018, a lot of people have struggled with belief because God, even in 2018, still remains intangible. Still remains intangible. And in as much as God has showed himself up previously in physical ways, Moses, God has showed himself in physical ways that people could relate with. And even though in the new generation, God has showed himself through Christ, who was a physical being that we could identify with. God showed up through the prophets. God showed up through even sometimes through the kings that lived up to the commandments of God. And God did so many things that people could identify with. But those things were not God in and of themselves. They represented God. But the essence, the essence of God, the essence of God still remains unknown. Hallelujah. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. This is where when Paul walks through Athens, and, and statues of honor. And then he comes to this one that it says, and he finds this one and he says, now this one that you have not named, this one that you have not come to fully understand, that speaks to the other power that sometimes takes over, that, is, uh, ca that cannot be identified, that cannot be conceptualized into a sculpture of some sort. Now that one, let me tell you about that God, who he is. Today, God still remains a mystery. I often sympathize with someone who wants to believe. There are people who want to believe, but who cannot believe, who find it difficult to believe. Who's going through an experience and their experience requires that they believe. But somehow their mind or, or their experience in life and their background does not allow them or enable them to believe. They don't have it in them 
to believe. Kotwa, what they are going through actually requires them to believe. It requires the intervention of God. And they recognize that, Tuguti. This situation that I'm going through right now, it is not one that I can deal with on my own. It requires something else to intervene. But I just don't have it in me to believe. Because who call or believing is not something that you can cause yourself to have. You don't, in as much as it's a, it's a decision, but it's not something that you decide, now I'm going to believe. Partly we call it a gift that comes from God. Partly we call it the prompting, the strengthening of the Spirit of God in you that starts witnessing, testifying about God. And nothing but God. Hallelujah. Amen. Now, in order for us to have an image of God, we, among it, back to basis, I want us to know that we are a church that has, since inception, shied away from any image that seeks to represent the image of God. We are a church that moves away, that frowns upon any image that seeks to represent the image of God. Amen. We are a church that is very specific in saying, God is the supernatural. Amen. And with God being the supernatural, the moment you take anything that is supernatural and you bring it into the natural. It ceases to become supernatural. It ceases to be supernatural. If you take God and you bring God into the physical and you represent God in the physical, he ceases to be God. Where people have been looking for evidence, for proof, for proof that there is God. If you are looking for evidence, we can point to the evidence of God. We can point to the evidence of the existence of God. The men and the women that were in the ship with Paul, they didn't believe the word of God that he delivered, but very soon they believed there was God. Because when the ocean rose up, they got to understand the voice of God. Very soon they realize there is a God. Yeah. And so we can point to the evidence of God. God in history has left evidence of his existence. In your own life, in your own life, when you stand now and reflect, God has given you evidence that he exists. In some parts you, have, you may have missed it, but I'm hoping that in the main you have actually caught it the various and the many things that God has done have served as evidence of the existence and the power of God in your life. But the one thing we cannot do is to give proof. There are legal pro practitioners here. There is, there is evidence that is laid in court and then there's proof. And those are two different things. The one thing that we cannot give is proof. Proof that there is God. Because proof now needs to be objective. Evidence is subjective. But proof, evidence is subjective. In other words, evidence of the work of God is different in my life compared to your life. Something may happen in your life and I tell you, there is evidence that God is doing something in your life. You may interpret that differently and say, hey, bang or you can say, hey, intanta. you know. So evidence is very subjective, which is why even a Colwyn, some people who are super spiritual will rise and jump up when God does something so small. And they will rise and jump up and say, I was looking for evidence. I was looking for confirmation. I was looking for a sign that God is alive and God is with me. And people may stand and say, what? Is that what you use to confirm your faith? Yeah. 
Evidence is very subjective. But proof is objective. Proof is, yeah, there it is. Everyone sees it. And the one thing we cannot do is to prove God. We cannot prove God. And, and but I want, I want to, to, to say it plainly that God does not seek to be proven. Not only can you not prove him, but he does not seek to be proven. He leaves evidence. He speaks through his creation. He does wonderful things in his handiwork. But he himself has no need to prove himself. God has no need to prove himself. And so one of the reasons God has not reduced him, when, when God came in the flesh through Christ, and I'll talk about that later, it wasn't to prove himself, it was to save the nation. It was to save the people. But he, in his mightiness, has never felt the need to say, let me prove to these people who I am. And so anyone that chooses to believe needs to believe in a God that cannot be seen. Anyone that chooses to believe needs to believe in the God that cannot be seen. The moment you find yourself in a space, in a church, in a gathering, in a community that has mechanisms that bring God into the physical, you know that this is not God. One of the sure ways of knowing that you are not part of a church of God is where God is brought to the physical and the supernatural is translated into the natural and symbolized and imagined. Images are created in the natural. Then you know you are not part of a church of God. You know you are not part of a church of God. And anything that has to do with the power of God, the work of God, and all of those, the moment we are obsessed with bringing it to the tangible so that you know you are not part of a God. Let me go on and say, if you are part of a culture, a part of a culture that explains the work of the supernatural, even in that culture, that explains the work of the supernatural through tangible things, then you know it is not of God. So it is key as a church as we come to seek the face of God to firstly know that the face of God cannot be seen. The face of God cannot be seen. But the qualities of God, the qualities of God are there for everybody to see. And so what God has revealed is his personality. What God has re revealed is his person, is his spirit, his nature, his traits. That's what we know of God. We may not see him, but we see his qualities. And so one of the sure ways of knowing that you are in the right gathering, in the right church, in the right community, in the right uh, culture, is understanding the qualities of God and looking for the qualities of God in that gathering. And I want to reduce the qualities of God to two things only, just this morning. 
two things only. Mkelo zong fundeli nguati ya makos. First Kings 8, chapter 27. First Kings 8, chapter 7. Omunyang Patelu Jeremiah 23, verse 23. Now, as Besuguma, I just want to quickly take you to the book of Timothy. Timothy 1, chapter 9. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Uh, verse 9. Second Timothy, uh, chapter 1, verse 9. And the Bible says, who has saved us and called us with the holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace, which was given to us in Christ Jesus before time began. It was in this, was it is and go be so all in well, go gem seven ye to kepa, go wela ke itabo. No musa esau piwa u Christu Jesu zingagabiko is cut. And the thought that I want to leave you with, that I want to communicate in the scripture, is the fact that the God that we praise, the God that we believe in, is a God that was there before the beginning of time. Is a God that was there before the beginning of time. And so when we talk about salvation and we talk about Christ and we talk about the work that Christ has done in our lives and we talk about the calling that we have received through Christ, everything that God has done since the advent of Christ, even before, it is something that God had started doing and ordained before the beginning of time. And I know that is something that is, 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 is again talking to people who are understanding things um, not in the physical but understanding but you have to imagine you have to imagine, allow yourself to imagine a, a moment in history where there was no time you have to go back and imagine a moment in history where there was no time. When God says, Gagwazi ungagabi biko, esi swini siga mame wako, Gagwazi ungagabi biko, esi swini siga mame wako, and I already called you out by name. Now I'm bringing it to the individual. Now God knew you before you were formed in your mother's womb. In other words, before your time, before your time started counting, before your counter started, God knew you. And he said, and I called you. And so his relationship with you started even before your time started. But in the context of what was before you were, God had already started forming his plans for you. In the same way, the work of God for the nation, the work of God for the world, the, the calling of God for the church, the body of Christ, was there before the beginning of time. God had already started his work for us in Christ. And so when we talk about God, I want us to understand we are talking about a being that supersedes time, that transcends time. To transcend is to be beyond. A God that transcends time. But when he transcends time, by implication, he transcends any matter. In other words, there is nothing that has been formed in time, which is why we cannot bring him to the physical. Because he was God be before any of the physical things, the materials 
that we used to represent him were there. Before any of those things were there, God was. And therefore, it would be silly and stupid and foolish to say this represents God. When God was there before this was. Are you with me, Bazanwan? Amen. I don't want to lose you. <laughs> yeah? now, I want you to go into your spiritual construct, your mental construct of the spiritual world. And in there, I want you to identify things Things that may have been, that you may have been taught as part of your culture, as part of Christianity in the church, as part of a church, maybe that you were part of before you joined this church. Because even for people who are now part of the Church of the Holy Ghost, who came from other churches, there's a certain foundation that you may have of who God is that you may have been taught in the previous church. And you may not realize how it actually subconsciously, subconsciously plays itself out in your relationship with God. And even in this church, there may be things that you were taught at the beginning and when I say at the beginning, there may be things that you were taught at the beginning when God had revealed himself in a particular way. And I want to say in a limited way at the time. And as God reveals himself again in a different way and a more dynamic way, you may still be struggling with an image of God that is based on what you knew when you were taught at the beginning. And maybe it is in your culture, maybe uh, and how you were taught about divinity in your culture, it has certain elements. And every culture, every culture, I said at the beginning, Gucci, every culture, every nation has a natural inclination to believe there is a God. But the expression of that God and the relationship with that God differs from culture to culture. Amen. But one of the common things in those cultures is that God is brought to the physical. Even about Israel, God allowed them to reduce him to the physical. And there were certain things about Israel so that they can understand the work of the supernatural. And so God was trying to nurse them into the understanding of who God is. But God was not saying, I am that God. God was not saying, I am in those things. And their reverence for the Ark of the Covenant, and they truly believed God was in the Ark of the Covenant. When that thing moved, they felt the move of God. When that, when that thing was, and I'm calling it that thing, when that thing, they, they felt the presence of God had departed from the community. Because in Yabo we stuck in God is in this thing. And God allowed that as part of nurturing. But God was beyond, above and beyond the Ark of the Covenant. God was above and beyond the Ark, period. But it was a symbol. It was a symbol for them 
to know because they had come from a nation where gods were physical. But if you go back, far back into Abraham, there were no such things. God moved in his spirit and revealed and spoke to them in person. But when this nation had reached a stage where they were so low, God had to abakatulis and nurture them into, back into faith and back into knowing God with an intention to graduate them and get them to a point where they fully understand a God that has no form. That was there before time, that was there before matter, and that was there before any matter. So I want you to, to hold on to that about this timeless God. This timeless God. Yes, second, sorry, uh, First Kings 8.27. Imbala unkulunkulu uyahlala emhlabeni na bheka izulu nezulu lamazulu ana alinakho okwanele pho lendlu engiyakhileyo incane kangakanani ngalophida Imbala unkulunkulu uyahlala emhlabeni na Bega izulu nezulu lamazulu alinakho okwanele alinakho ukwanela pho lendlu engiyakhileyo incane kangakanani ngiyabonga ophethe u Jeremiah 23 Jeremiah 23, verse 1. Verse 23. And 24, yeah. Verse 23. 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 Angiyukumbona na usho Jehova akugcwele yini izulu nomhlaba na usho u Jehova yabonga uthi uNkulunkulu ngomlomo womprofet eh u Jeremiah ngiyuNkulunkulu oseduze na angisiyena yini uNkulunkulu okude futhi and so he's challenging Kabanga Goba Israel. Am I a God that is only nearby? Am I a God that is only nearby? And am I not a God also that is far away? So here's God challenging people that have come to limit him only as a God that is nearby, that is close to us, that is tangible, that is physical. And God says, well, am I just a God that is nearby? In other words, are you only focusing on the things that I have revealed to you about me that you now see? But am I not also a God that is far away? that remains unknown, unseen, and perhaps even inaccessible in the physical. Have you just reduced me to this? When I read the scripture, because because there are parts of me that you don't know, that I have not showed you, that I have chosen not to show you. And God is having that conversation with Israel. He says, no, wait, wait, wait. Have you just 
if you just decided I am a God that is only nearby, but am I also not a God that is far away, that occupies all the corners of the world and all the spheres of the world? And he says, do I not feel the heaven and the earth? Who can hide in secret places so that I cannot see them? And so the first thing that we need to accept now, when you go to um, the book of Kings, and the king, Solomon, is dedicating the temple. And as he's dedicating the temple, he's in awe of the greatness of God. And he says, but... He says, but even the heaven, the heaven of the heavens is not enough to contain you. How much more this little temple that I have built? And Solomon says this, and we know from history that he built the greatest and the biggest and the most magnificent structure, the temple of God. But in that moment of worship, he recognizes how great and how big God is. And he says, but are you a God that dwells on earth? Are you even a God that dwells only in heaven? And he says, but I know that even heaven, nor the earth, is enough, has got enough capacity to contain you. We need to hear this. He says, not even heaven in its vastness, in its bigness, in its majesty, in its size. Not even heaven can contain you. You are a God that needs to overflow onto earth. But when you overflow onto earth, even the earth cannot contain you. Heaven and earth cannot contain the greatness of God, the bigness of God, because he created heaven and earth. He created because he was there before time, before heaven and earth was created. And so what he created and called heaven and set the kingdom of heaven and what he subsequently created, which is earth, and called the kingdom of earth, those are both his creations and what he created as the universe and set the stars and the moon and the sun and everything that showcases who God is, he created that. But those things that he created cannot, cannot contain God. Cannot contain God. There is no place that we can build on earth and say, here lives God. Here lives God. There is nothing that we can make on earth and say, here is God. You, you need to allow God to be. You need to allow God to be a free form God. He might be free from God. He is free from form. He cannot be formed. He cannot be molded. And one of the mistakes that human beings make because of our knowledge, because of our experience, because of our anxiety with anything that we don't understand is to want to create containers for God. Solomon has a revelation that the temple that he has built is a very tiny and small container that even the big toe of God will not fit in. He's, he quickly realizes, Uguti, if you cannot occupy the vastness of the heavens and the earth, how much more is this that I've built for you? 
the first recognition that drives a person to believe. Now that you believe, now that you've walked, you've seen things that are created, and you've said, surely someone has created this. And now as you proceed to look for his face and find his face and look for evidence and maybe even look for proof that he lives, firstly, believe that you will not find him in any physical form. Is all of what I said is when you, if you came here looking for something physical that will tell you God exists, you've come to the wrong place. Nothing physical that will give you. And yesterday I was lamenting how Christians bow before us, people who are called by God. And I'm reminded of the appearance of an angel in Revelations. And when, when John bowed before the angel, he says, no, do not bow before me. Because I'm, you, I am, I'm a priest like you. And all of us are serving the great God. Worship God. Worship God. But we as human beings want this, this experience. And so we have created, don't ever call me that, we have created men of God. We have created men of God. And some have imposed themselves over us. We have created and dedicated places that we say this is where God lives. We have created places that we say this is where God lives. We have created means and cultures of interacting with God, physical ways of interacting with God. And God is saying, it's okay. It's okay if it facilitates your quick understanding of who I am. There's nothing wrong, and I want to say this so that you don't walk away confused. There's nothing wrong with honoring a servant of God. There's nothing wrong with honoring a servant of God. There's nothing wrong with giving respect to the servant of God. But there's everything wrong with worshiping a servant of God. There's everything wrong with worshiping and according a status that is near God to a man that God uses. Because before me, God used many other men and after me, God will use many other men and women. And I have a very healthy understanding of that. In fact, I love that. You know why I love it? Because it means if I mess up, God will self-correct through others. But when you have occupied a position of being near God and being the it man, you carry the full accountability of the mess that you create sometimes. But when you know what you are part of a privileged group, you, you've been given is van de la paya in Simana Jengane, which now leave If if go nagala, God will fix it. But do your best to go nagala. That's my motto. Yeah? Do your best to go nagala, but uma go nagala, God will fix it through others. I know right now, part of what I'm doing even today, I am fixing. I am fixing the man before me messed up a little bit. And it's got nothing to do with them or judging. It's, it's simply saying we are men. We are human beings. And so the two men before me walked with God fully and honestly, and they revered God, and they were used by God. But they also made a couple of mistakes. I don't know what those mistakes are. I'm not coming in saying I know what, I don't know what those mistakes are. But I discover, as God says, 
nyatela la paya, yenzaga njelo la paya. And I realized, oh, that is different to what they did. And I say certain things, and I'm like, oh, no, but that's not what they said. And God is self-correcting. But someone who has an image of God that is fixated on the natural and the physical, to them what I'm saying now is blasphemy. How can you say a man of God made a mistake? There's only one church, and I'm, there's only one church that talks about the infallibility of a leader. And we are not that church. Hallelujah. Amen. We are not that church. And the church that believes in the infallibility of a leader has set itself up. Has set itself up. And has set its leader up. Because all leaders are fallible. All structures are fallible. All cultures and practices are fallible. But only God is infallible. Amen. I have an opportunity. I have an opportunity to stand before you and preach to you how great I am. But that would stunt your spiritual experience. Every single person who stands before a group of believers has an opportunity to preach about themselves and about how great they are and, who, and how close they are to God. But every person who takes that opportunity stunts the growth of the church. And every member who allows themselves to sit under such ministry stands themselves of the opportunity to experience the true God. When I said to you yesterday, you do not need me, I mean that to the core of my heart. You do not need me. God has appointed me, but you do not need me. For as long as you know the voice of God Amen. and the qualities of God, and the qualities of God. And so, what I've just said with you is the first thing that you need to know about God, that God is great. Amen. God is great. Amen. Let me be charismatic and say, God is great. Amen. He is great. But I, but I want you to imagine great because we say it all the time, God is great, but we don't know what we mean. And today I've just said with you, the greatness of God is such that he cannot be reduced to anything. He cannot be brought to the physical. He cannot live in any structure. He cannot live in any temple. He cannot be represented fully by any man. And so when you say it now again, say it with understanding, God is great. God is great. God is great. Mkulu unkulu unkulu. Mkulu unkulu unkulu. The first thing that anyone, anyone, that one, Matthew 9, Matthew 9, the first thing that anyone who wants to believe, needs to accept and understand. And, and if, you, if you take this today, it will, it will really assist you in your faith. It will really assist you in your walk with God. If you take it and truly believe in it, God is great. Whatever you come across in life, and you are ruled by this thing, but God is great. Whatever matter you come across in life and you are ruled by this thing, but God is bigger than matter. Whatever limitation you come across in life and you say, but God is timeless. Whatever delays you are experiencing in life and you say, but God was there before time. And you are experiencing things being late 
or you are experiencing things happening too fast, or you are experiencing things happening before time, and you're like, but why, why is there confusion between time and purpose? But when you settle in this knowledge that actually my God is not controlled by time. My God is not defined by time. He defines time. He sets the time. God sets the hour. He sets the time. And one of the reasons Christians become so desperate in their walk with God and whatever wants they have, whatever petitions and requests they've sent up to God, oh God, I want this. Oh God, do this for me. Oh God, sort this out for me. And God is like, yeah, I've heard you. But God is not moving according to your expectation. Then they're like, hey, God, but time is running. And God says, but whose time are you looking at? Whose time are you looking at? Am I not a God? Am I only a God that is near? Am I only a God that is near? In other words, am I only a God... And yes, I am a God that listens and that responds. And that's what we have been taught. When you pray to God, he will listen to you and he will respond. And that is true. But God says, but am I also not a God who is far away? Am I also not a God who takes his time? Why is it that you have reduced me to this knowledge of a God who responds in time that you can control? When, when we've said this is who God is and we've brought him to the natural order of things, we start controlling God. We start controlling God. Let me tell you there are times when God allows us to control him. There are times where God allows us to appear to be in control. He responds to our needs as we ask. But there are times where God sits back and says, no, but I'm God. Now, you will wait for me. And I'm not, wait, I'm not making you wait because I'm being, I'm being funny as God. No, I'm working it out. I'm working it out. Like a mother, there are times where um figure, um don't say anything, no, I don't say anything, Anxas listened. Um, don't say You know, there are times where a mother will take and say, "Okay, me, nanti nyama either." You know, just to please you and to, you know, they understand you are hungry. But there's a time where the mother says, "No, you have to wait." Agagalungi. And God wants us to know that about Him. He is near and He is far. Use tuze futugute. You, you, you need to get that. He is near you and he is far from you. He is close to you and he's also far from you. He is small enough. There's a song I think that we used to sing at preschool. He is small enough to fit in your heart. Yet he is big enough that no heaven or earth can contain him. He is small enough to fit into your plan. Yet he is great enough that he defines the universal plan. And anyone that wants to believe needs to be okay with that. Needs to hold that in their mind. Don't simplify God. Don't oversimplify God. Don't sit under a teaching and an instruction that simplifies God. I've come to break the tradition in the Church of the Holy Ghost. And say even our own traditions, beautiful as they are, have the risk of controlling the move of God. 
Even our own traditions and our own structure as the Church of the Holy Ghost. Even our own understanding of God and how we were taught God. And we were taught a true God. One of the things I appreciate, I love about the founder of this church and the second servant in this church is they taught us the true God. In a generation where African independent churches were taking up position and preaching a different God that is represented through men. This church made a decision right from the beginning to embrace Trinity, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. Amen. And this church was founded on a full understanding that there is only one true God. Amen. I don't know how many of you still know this and believe this and practice this, but we as a church, for example, we do not, if ever you get a cross, one of the early teachings when I was very young is we do not accept a cross that has an image of a man on it. We don't wear it, we don't put it up in our homes, we don't keep it anywhere. Because we believe in Christ, the Son of God, who is above and beyond the one who was hanging on the cross. We believe in the power of the cross. And the one who was hanging on the cross is our Savior. But we have an understanding of Christ that, as the Bible, as Timothy says, God set our plan in Christ before time. So we believe in the Son of God that was before Jesus Christ was born. That was with God. When John 1 verse 1 says, At the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. We believe in that. And so we, you know, in the arguments, in the arguments in the Christian circles around, but was Christ black or was he white? Did he look like this blue-eyed pale man or was he brown-skinned? Actually, we don't care. We don't care because there is a distraction but we believe in the cross and in the cross we were saved now I'm not saying at an intellectual level we shouldn't challenge certain images of Christianity because they are vehicles that have been used to push a particular agenda and theology. And so it's okay at a, at a human level to interact in those, con in, in those conversations. But those do not inform. We do not reject Christ because he's pale and blue-eyed. And we do not accept him because he's brown-skinned. Whether he's pale or brown, we believe in the Son of God. Amen. And that's one of the things I truly truly honor about the church of the Holy Ghost. The teaching that is biblically sound. That is biblically sound. Matthew, Matthew 9. Now I want to go to the second thing and allow me, indulge me a little bit and say, Matthew 9, verse 13. Ujesu esesuga lapo, zamla ndela izimpumpute ezimbili, zaka la zati, si hauge lendo tana gata vida. 28. Sengene enjin izimpumpute zeza guye, ujesu wati guye guzo. Niagukolwa niagu uguba, gingawenza lo kuna. Zati kuye ye bongos. Kona wapata amesho azo. Wati agubegini njengo kukolo agwe. Ya bonga. Ujesu is being followed by two blind men. 
and they are saying to him, so they've come to believe in him and they see him. And they see him not as a son of Joseph, but as a son of David. And they see him as a son of God who has the power to do things. And so, and they are blind. They don't see this man physically, but they perceive. Spiritually, they perceive. They perceive his power, his majesty, his kingship. And so they say, have mercy on us, son of David. Have mercy on us, son of David. Do you believe that I'm able to do this? According to your faith, let it be done to you. And so, Exodus 3, verse, sorry, 34, verse 6, and that's the last one. And Namtanje, Umasiza, seeking the face of God, seeking the power of God, the work of God, the move of God, the response of God. When you've accepted that God is great, one of the mistakes that particularly traditional churches make is to then instill a fear of God that is about trembling and being afraid and therefore not being able to relate with God. And the Bible does ask of us, it does command us to fear the Lord. But the fear that the Bible speaks of is the reverence. The reverence is around just understanding that this is something big and great that is beyond you. And therefore, you must have reverence of it. And, and, and the English word that we use is fear. But it is not the fear like we are afraid of beasts. That this thing is going to cause me harm. And so the second thing, the second, I said I'll give you two things about God that if you understand, you will give you an image of God. So one is the greatness of God. And I remember when I was seven, eight, or nine, when I was taught the greatness of God, I imagined this big man sitting on a big chair and being above the clouds. That's the image that we mostly had when we were young. Yeah. But today I understand it differently. The second part, therefore, that is important in understanding God and not being beast afraid of God, that is, he's going to cause me harm because he's not, he did that, yes, and he is that too. But God is a good God. And allow me to be charismatic again and tell your neighbor, God is good. God is good. And when you accept that God is good, you have to accept that God wants to do good for you. He is a great God. He is a big God. He is a powerful God. He is an almighty power over anything in life. But in all of this, he is good. He has a good heart. He has a good spirit. He has a good nature. Hallelujah. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. And so I said to you earlier on, if you walk into any gathering, any community, any church, where God is being brought into the physical and reduced into a little box or a little image on the wall, walk away, run, that's not God. And it's not of God. But secondly, when you walk into any place, 
where God is not good. And people might not say that God is not good. But they are not good. Walk away, run away, fly away. Where the goodness of God is not represented. The God that we worship is a good God. And there are many words that are used in the Bible that, that defines the goodness of God. John says, God is love. John says, anyone that says they love God but they hate their brother, they are lying. Because God is love. So that's what he uses to talk about the goodness of God. I want you to think and imagine how good God is. I want, can I take you on a little journey? Let's close your eyes. And imagine this power. Imagine this power that is big, great, forceful. It is around you, it is behind you, it is in front of you, it is on your side, it is below your feet, above your head. Powerful, quiet, silent, but powerful. Imagine this power that presses from all sides and is constantly making things change. You can feel your body is changing. The power that takes away the pain in your body. It comes from all directions. It pushes against your head. It takes away the confusion, the doubt, the stress in your head and your heart. And I'd like you to imagine as you look through this power and trying to understand, see light. It is white, but a bright white that cannot compare to anything. It is warm. It is embracing. It is reassuring. Experience its love. It is loving. And it says to you, I'm here for your good. No plan to harm you. No plan to destroy you. I just want what is good for you. And that is God. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. Exodus, Exodus 34. Exodus 34, verse 6. See a funda in one tiga exodus thirty four, over six, six to seven. Uchehova, Wadlula, Pambiwake, Wamemes, Awati, Uchehova, Uchehova, Unculunculu, Ohaugelayo, Ono Musa, Obegesela, Ova, Ma, Ubune, Nekinis, seven. 
Otina abaizin kulungwa nengo bunene. Otechelela ububi. Nogwe no gwe tuga no gon. Yebonga kulu. And he passed in front of Moses proclaiming, The Lord, the Lord, the compassionate and gracious God, slow to anger, abounding in love and faithfulness, maintaining love to thousands and forgiving wickedness, rebellion and sin. The God that we worship and the reason why we worship him, he is a good God. He is an all-round great, gentle God. An all-round good and gentle God. His love, his compassion, his grace, all works miraculous and wonderful things in our lives. And what he wants is for us to live a good life. What he wants for us is for us to progress, for us to thrive, for us to be well, for us to feel loved, for us to truly experience the wonderful gift of life that he has given. He has given us this life. It, we are not here by accident. He has given us and he wants us to have a good life on earth and for us to know that he has provided this life to us and so anything that pushes you towards fear anything that pushes you towards sadness anything that pushes you towards guilt regret, shame. And I know we talk about sin in the church and, and we, we work out the sin in a person. But anything that makes you feel shame and separates you from self-confidence is not of God. Because God, the Bible says, and I read this last, last, last week in church. The Bible says, taste, taste, and know that God is good. God tastes good. God is good. Taste and know that God is good. And it says, anyone that trusts and believes in him shall not be covered in shame. And so, when you come into church and some of the things and one of the things that has made people to believe in God but not want to associate with a particular church is that sometimes the church can represent God as a judging God and therefore that amplifies the shame of where I've been how wrong I've been in my life, or where I'm still stuck and not growing spiritually. But the church of God, and therefore the people of God, who understand the spirit of God and the nature of God, represent the good of God. Every single one who walks into the house, every single one who walks into church, every single one who comes to find the Father is welcome with embracing hands. Amen. That says, you've come to the right place. There's no other place where you will find the type of unconditional ac acceptance that you find in the house of God. And this is not the house of God, but this is a place where we gather but you've come into the true house of God 
which is in the spirit of God. Amen. Where love lives. The two things that I want you to know, and I'm we're going to conclude in prayer. The two things that I want you to know. God, firstly, know that God, we can only imagine, he, imagine him. He can give us evidence, but he does not need to prove himself. And he will not prove himself. There will be no proof. But we know him and we worship him because we understand he's great. And therefore, the God that we praise is a great God. Big, mighty, cannot be contained into anything. The second nature of God that we accept and know is he is good. He is good. And so as I conclude, Vazalwane, what God asks of the church, what God asks of the church is that the church in all its work, in all its message, teaching, practice, represents greatness. The church cannot represent a great God, but the church be below great. It, it doesn't gel. And so what God asks of us is that we need to strive for greatness. Amen. To truly show the world who God is and represent all parts and sides of God. The church needs to live up to the calling of being great. We have been called into greatness. Amen. When in the New Testament Paul speaks and later on other uh, disciples speak, they say, we have been called into royal priesthood. We have been called into greatness. You are sitting here today. But I want you to get it in you that you have been called into greatness. And the greatness that God has called you into cannot be compared to any office on the land. There is no office in the land. There is no office in the presidency or in government or in any corporate business, whatever. There is no office or position that can match the great, even in the church, there is no office that can match the greatness to which God has called you. The church needs to rise up to the greatness. I'm calling you to be great. I am calling you to be great. I am calling you to rise up. I am calling you to fill up. Fill up. Fill up the earth. Fill up the heaven. Fill up the space. Become a great church. Amen. Secondly, the good God that we are worshiping is calling us to goodness. We need to be a good church. And I've just used one definition of good, which is love. And I think that is the essence of it all. We need to be a good church. But for us to be a good church, you need to be a good person. You need to be a good person. You need to be a good lady, good to other ladies in the church, good to younger ladies in the church, good to Ogoko, good to Omkulu. Be the good lady that when somebody walks in here and says, the entire church rises up and say, pick one of us. If you want a good person, you will find them in the church. You need to be a good man. God wants you to be a good man. And I'm not going to spend time unpacking that, but God wants you to be a good man. That truly 
showcases the image of God. And when it ever gets to the point like it did with Philip when Christ was with the disciples and Philip said, Lord, show us the Father. Christ turned back and said, but Philip, I've been with you for so long. Do you still not know me? And that's who God wants us to be. Great people and good people. May the Lord be with all of you. Amen.